but uh, I've I feel like I feel like there's um like you're in the midst of another more drawn out awakening like there's there's some there's still some like a feeling that there's something out there for you still like like you're like as if you're um anticip not anticipating but expecting expecting something um where are you at with your awakening I think I I think it's a never ending journey to heal. Uh, I think I'm sort of been in the void, uh, and now I'm sort of slowly easing into what I'm supposed to do, my mission, which is also very evolving. Uh, so I, I think this podcasting is part of my mission. That's where I'm at. When you say void, what does that mean to you? Ah, uh, it just means that I had to rest, rest. Ooh, I like that rest that's that's a really that's a much better way of saying it i love that yeah Um, i've been resting for three years yeah yeah it's time for you to go i suppose that is ready yeah it's It's time to yeah get out of bed (laughs) (laughs) that's cool okay well i am completely uh surrendering to this whole thing so whenever okay ready okay all right i'm ready let's do it okay let's do it let's do it all right so today i have the real honor and pleasure of meeting you franco romero hello hello how are you i'm very well we had a chat here just before we started and um, i feel so much i feel so refreshed now by just having (laughs) you here you know what so do i actually (laughs) I'm glad we had this conversation before because I do feel refreshed. Ah, you know, this is yeah. good. This is good. Yeah, I feel so much lighter and yeah, I feel really happy. I'm yeah, really happy. <laughs> maybe we can, <laughs> together, maybe we can make some other people happy through this interview. Yeah, I hope so. Let's do it. All Let's right, it. Franco, now please, can you tell me who are you? That is a big question. <laughs> Um, as a person, uh, I am very much like anybody else, just going through life, trying to figure out uh, what this whole thing is about. Um, and in the process of that, I have asked many questions about that particular thing. Who am I? Am I really franco or am i something more and i i su- i suspect you're probably asking me more like what what am i or like what is it that i do but um in that vein i do a lot of um, coaching and teaching and guiding i on a spiritual track i actually define myself or or describe myself as a physical manifestation of what you would consider to be your spiritual guide. Um, So I will, I work with people who are doing some really intimate and, and oftentimes just gentle soul searching of those questions about life, their spiritual life. And I guide people through the process of what we would call an awakening uh, of sorts. And it's been a very rewarding experience because in that process of doing that, it has helped me to realize who I am spiritually. So as, and it, it gets deeper, like what we did just before this conversation, just being able to tap into people's soul. Cause that's what I do when I work with people is I feel their frequencies. I feel their soul. And I help them to experience that relationship that they didn't even know they had with their own self. I hope that answers the question that you were asking. Mm, Beautiful. And Franco, what brought you into this spiritual path? What's that? (laughs) What happened there? Okay. All right. Um, You know, those are, those are simple simple questions i have to admit but the answers could be very very deep um so i'll i'll be i'll kind of abbreviate things a little bit so everybody has a very unique what i would call 
life where you're you it's a mixture of journey and quest okay the journey is the stuff that we experience outside of ourselves you know this whole thing we we call life and the the quest is the exploration of who we are inwardly the the thing that calls us to 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 well at times to greatness but if nothing else just to remember remember who we really truly are outside of this world so my story began when i was very very young i was six months old when i had a, a near-death experience and you know every near-death experience is different and it's unique and it's beautiful and it's powerful and i suspect that mine i always say mine is a little bit odd or or whatnot which is kind of hard to even say how could that be because i mean all near death experiences are in some way kind of odd um but at six months old i i died for a brief period of time i um i had and by the way i should mention this because i oftentimes people right at this point will go oh, wait a minute six months old how could you even have had any remembrance of something like this. And to be fair, I didn't. Um, I didn't know that I had died at six months. But my life throughout my early years was filled with very strange events. And probably the, the strangest in my early years was the fact that I had lived in a house that was extraordinarily uh, paranormal. Um, and it really was a very bizarre time <laughs> to be, wow. to be honest. Um, imagine every kind of movie, especially the older ones that mm -hmm. like, like movies like the exorcist or things of that nature. Imagine those kind of movies together combined. Um, it was basically what I lived for six years and I didn't even know that it was, anything different i felt like this was kind of normal even though it was very scary at times um so that was a big part of my of my very early years okay so none of this um, none of this connected me back to anything that had happened when i was six months old so i'll just just really quickly tell you that um i i I was very, very sick with um, with some um, bronchitis, pneumonia type of symptoms. And um, when I was brought in to the hospital, my mother um, didn't expect it to be as severe, and nor did the doctors really. They, they did want to keep me overnight just to make sure that they could observe and make sure that it, nothing was going to get worse, but it got worse pretty bad and fast. And um, and to make a, a real long story short, I um, my mother was a very religious woman, and um, she was she was Catholic. She has since passed, but um, but at the time when she was told by the doctors that I wasn't going to make it through the night, that actually I was probably only going to be able to make it for a few more hours. She um she did something somewhat unusual, which was that she she told me later on because by the way, I was actually when when I was fifteen, I started having visions and dreams about this event. I started to experience uh being in a hospital, a, a very kind of um old hospital so to speak because i actually at the time i was i was living in south america and i was born there and um and so the hospitals were more like clinics you know they were smaller and whatnot mm -hmm. and um and i just remember being there and i saw my mother uh, sitting on the bed near a near this this kind of incubator where there was this baby and it didn't take very long. And I had these visions and dreams for for many months. Um, they were, <laughs> at first, they, they just seemed like, okay, that was natural because I had always had lucid dreams and I always had repetitive dreaming. And and so to me, this wasn't necessarily unusual, but but it just kept going and going. And it was as if there was something that I really needed to to understand about, about those dreams. And 
so anyway, I saw her and she was crying and she was by the by this by this baby. And there were some other people there that I some I recognized, some I didn't. And um, and I went through the whole process of of mourning with her because she went from the hospital to a nearby church. Um, I remember her getting on her knees like a block away from the church. It was like this boulevard that led up to the church and she wa she crawled all the way to the church and went inside and all on her knees and then went to the altar and and um and instead of praying the way you would expect people to pray you know asking for for a miracle so to speak she didn't pray that way she was actually filled with so much gratitude and appreciation for just having had me for six months in her life. And it was so touching. I remember that I started to feel like I was going to cry in in, mm. in these visions and dreams because I could feel her. I, I, I could feel her emotions and I could feel just the tremendous love that she had for, and the appreciation again that she had just for my existence even though she knew that by the time she got back to the hospital she would um, likely be told that i was dead and so instead of spending the last hour or two of my life in the hospital either touching me or holding me um she went to she went to church and prayed for, for thanks and um there were so many emotional energies that I could feel. It was really kind of the first time I remember I had, I had had many different types of empathic abilities as a child, but this one was so unique because I could really feel her soul. And, um, and it was so pure and it was so beautiful. Um, I, I could feel that every time she had a vision or a, a thought, she could change the energy in the room, in, in the church. And so when, when she went from, from appreciation to gratitude, and I could feel that, and I could feel the energy slowly changing into something really light and beautiful. And at that point, she started to see visions of my life, of what my life would have been like had I stayed and growing up and becoming a young man and, and getting married and the father that I would be and the husband and the person that I would be for people. And it just filled her heart up. And it was so strange because I could feel it too. And um, at one point, it finally just got to where she just was so at peace with what was about to happen that she, she started to cry and, and as she got up, the room just changed. It just was so light and beautiful. And there was, there was this glow all over the church and she walked back. She didn't run or anything. She just walked back. And, and when she got to the hospital, um, everybody was waiting for her at the door and she they were crying so she expected them to tell her that i i had passed away while she was gone and instead they told her that there had been a miracle that i all my organs and everything when she left were closing they were just shutting down and and they they just came back my vitals came back everything came back and and pretty much all the symptoms that i had had with the with the pneumonia were literally gone. And the next day, um, she uh, took me home. And she talked about the miracle, the doctors, you know how doctors are, especially back then, you know, <laughs> if they couldn't, if they couldn't understand something, they would just call it a medical miracle. And that was it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Spot on. <laughs> that's it. They wouldn't, they wouldn't examine it yeah. anymore. They didn't look yeah. into it anymore. So mm -hmm. anyway, um, I, um, there was a second part to this whole dreaming process that, that also, um, I had, a, in, in some ways it had a, uh, a, a deeper effect on me, which was to say that, um, I dreamt that I was back in the hospital room and 
I wasn't, she wasn't there because at that point she was probably at the church. And, um, and I remember that I could feel the, the, the sort of the soul light of the, of the child leaving and I could feel it as if it were me. And I remember feeling sort of drawn up to the ceiling and there was, there was this sense of, of lightness and, and shine that I, I felt drawn to. And so for whatever reason, which I actually do kind of know now what it was all about, but for whatever reason, I found myself in, in, um, in the desert. Like it was like sand everywhere, everywhere. And I was, I was levitating above a crowd of people. And, um, and I, and I realized that, that they noticed me. And so I, was staring. Yeah, I wasn't very high up. I was maybe 10, 10 feet or so up. I mean, it wasn't very high up. And um, I particularly saw this older gentleman and he was very, um, he, he looked very frail, very, very frail. And he was reaching his hand up as though to ask for something. And he was looking at me. But what I realized after just a few moments was that he wasn't really looking at me. He was looking through me. And so when I turned to see what he was looking at, I saw this beautiful, beautiful, like white light, like an orb. And it was probably 10 times bigger than our sun, you would, you know, and, and I was, I was, the, the only thing I thought about at that moment was I was surprised that it didn't hurt my eyes. Um, I could stare right wow. into it and it was so warm and it was so, you know, when, when something happens that doesn't exist here in third dimension, it's really hard to use third dimensional words to describe words, yeah. it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, I've, I have tried for so long to explain the feeling of what this light was like. And I know others have tried as well. And I've given it so many different names. And in, in the book that I wrote, uh, I, I, I just did a couple of years back, I talk about this experience. And, um, and, I, and in certain parts of the experience, I call, I call that light and the feeling I had of that light was, um, well, I called it the million hugs. Um, and even that, you know, when you get a hug, how good that feels. But, and so imagine a million of them. But it really doesn't even come close to what it felt like. Um, I'm not sure if I could say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. You can always <laughs> edit it out. It. Okay. No, I won't. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, people say you have 50 trillion cells in your body. And actually, there were moments throughout that second dream, because I this dream I also had quite often. Um, and I knew they were connected to the first dream, but often in that second experience, what I really felt, and even this doesn't come close to it, is that I, I was experiencing 50 trillion orgasms and it was blissful. It was ecstasy at the highest levels that you could possibly have. You, it was, wow. it was love of it was a love that doesn't exist here on, on this plane. And as much as we strive to have that experience of love here, it's the way that we have been taught to express it and experience it here is very limiting. Um, it's, it's so much more expansive. It's so much more expansive. It's you give that same feeling to everybody. You don't just give it to one individual you give it to everybody. And so, um, so anyway, I, that experience led me to, to go into the light, which that light just consumed me. And, um, it was in that experience that I, I realized that when, when I said there was 50 trillion cells in your body, I actually experienced myself, myself con from a consciousness standpoint i experienced myself as 50 trillion me's i actually at one point could i could really acknowledge identify all of these aspects of me at one time which is 
again, really hard to explain because there's no, nothing like that here. Um, but I didn't see myself as a body. I saw myself as a collective of all these consciousness. And um, so anyway, I, I, I went into the light um, the way a lot of people would describe it. It was extraordinarily beautiful. It was extraordinarily um the the one thing that i really really experienced more than more than anything and that that says a lot because i experienced a lot in in the time that i was in the light was that i experienced the true definition of of what we would call oneness um which ironically isn't necessarily oneness in the way that we would describe it it's actually um something that when i was in the light i i got to experience um what it was like to feel an unlimited number of beings, light beings um, that were surrounding me and knowing who they were in my spiritual life, um, knowing each and every one of them very intimately um, and knowing that they knew me very intimately and experiencing what I guess you would call your soul family who surrounded me. And when they, when they embraced me with their hugs, I literally blew up into a ball of light and I no longer could identify myself as, as anything that was me before it just didn't exist. Now, again, this was like 15 years later and there is a, a pretty easy, but yet somewhat complicated explanation for how I could have experienced that. Um, if you can understand that time doesn't exist, really, you can mm -hmm. understand how you can teleport your consciousness into that same event um, because it's happening at the same time. So um, that's the real simple definition of it, but there's a little bit more to that. Um, in, in any event, before I left that, before I left, because I knew I was coming back, I, di I didn't get the sense that I was being asked to stay. But in a sense, there's a little bit of a sidebar to that too. But what I saw, and the, it was almost as if I had to stay there long enough to see something because it was kind of part of the messages that I had to come back and share with humanity. So when you ask me about, you know, what, who am I, you know, sort of like, what is it that I do or what have you, there's a lot more to my story that's just too much to, to explain, but I brought back messages. Um, and I know that every near-death experience person has stories to tell and even messages to bring um but what i came to find out a little bit later on in life because i had always felt this way i just couldn't pinpoint it there's a, a process in the near-death experience that some people have not very many and and that's what would be called a walk-in experience and i'm not sure if you're familiar with that term but if it a walk-in experience is where the soul that was in the body originally decides that it doesn't want to come back. And so since the body in this case was a baby and it had all of its life to still experience, um, it gets, it gets substituted in with another soul by permission. So, you know, the soul has to decide they want to stay in what we would, let's just call it for now, heaven. Um, when that happens, the body can be taken by another soul. Usually when that happens, it's usually because the soul that's coming in has a very unique purpose to be here. It's not just to fulfill another, to fulfill the life of that, of that body. The, and it is kind of like an avatar body. It actually is an avatar to be more honest. Um, it's because that soul is here to, to do something to do something in service for humanity. And so um, that was something I knew. I I knew deep down inside, I had, I, I wasn't really quite fitting into this body. Um, it felt like a good suit, but it didn't feel like it was mine. Um, and from, from, it took like a while because I came back with with a lot, with a lot of near-death experience, people will tell you you come back with with heightened senses of your ability to do variety of things that would be called clairvoyant. Okay, so so I I came back very clairvoyant. 
um, I, I could, um, my biggest, my biggest thing is, is that I can, I can speak to people's souls, you know, so a lot of people will speak to people who pass on. I speak to people while they're still here, but <laughs> Yeah. And which is kind of interesting, right? But I mean, I think you felt that a little bit when, when, before we got on this. Uh, yeah, this I felt it the whole day. I had yeah. this edgy feeling. I, I, I couldn't actually put my words. I wasn't nervous and I wasn't uncomfortable. I, I just couldn't, I can't find it. But it was just a weird feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. But that was, that's what I that was. I was prepared. <laughs> Yeah. And um, that would be a best, good way of describing a lot of people who um, interview me will say the same thing or even. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 yeah um, I or students that I now teach, you know, because um, I teach how to tap into those kind of frequencies and stuff because we all have them. Um, so they will tell me the same thing that they get edgy and <laughs> like because because even though I don't do it on purpose but i i'm i start reading people way before we get on and start talking i'm not even i'm not even aware of it m most of the time but by the time we get together like when we got together just before the interview i could feel you um and i told you that and you know it was it was pretty obvious so um so anyway um i i'm i'm a walk in and a walk in typically and I'm going to just be straightforward about it. It's nothing, nothing huge about it, but, but it can be sometimes misinterpreted, uh, especially in this day and age where we, where we, um, we, we do have a lot of awareness around like narcissism and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So in the old days, many, many, many years ago, a walk-in would have been viewed as an emissary it's an angelic walk-in so angelics meaning that um the energy that is in, in that that is me is comes from from what we would call um directly from source or god or what have you and in, in the old days um they would be considered emissaries or prophets and so i i would view myself that way as well uh, the messages that i have are are somewhat yes different mm -hmm. than than what others are talking about not too extraordinarily different but it adds a lot more clarity a lot a lot a lot more clarity to to what we're doing here all of us and why we're here and why now why why now why is this all happening now where people where there's this feeling of awareness that we just can't put our fingers on but when when I talk about it, it's the truths that I come came back with, people get it. They just sit there and they get it. They understand. It's like something just awoken in them. So um, so anyway, um, I'll finish the, the the part of the the dream that I had was that after I came out of the light, um, I realized something that I was supposed to see while I was there, and what I saw was um, it wasn't just a collection of light beings. I mean, and they were everywhere and they didn't have faces. We don't we don't have those kind of human characteristics um, when we go back there. OK, um, we have a semblance of light that, that has sort of a shape to it that would kind of be considered kind of like a human body, but not really a human body. Um, but, um, but what I saw, because I told you it was like endless, it was just trillions and tr I mean, just everywhere. The light was everywhere, everywhere. These individual pieces of light were everywhere. Um, the biggest, probably the biggest message, um, although they're all pretty big, is that what I was supposed to see and bring back to humanity, which was kind of a different view of who we are. So... Uh, this day and age, if you're somewhat spiritual, and even if you're not, but maybe you're just catching these messages in some sort of other context, religious or otherwise, there's a lot of talk about the light, the light of God being inside of you or around you, that you're like an essence of God. There's a, you know, what have you, an aspect, you're an aspect of God. But the message that I um, was was told to bring back was to share with humanity that we we, we're not just essences of God. We are God. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that God didn't create us. 
in the sense that God decided one day to experience itself in a human existence. Mm -hmm. Um, we came together collectively as extreme supreme beings. I mean, I am talking at the highest, 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 highest level. <laughs> we came together yeah. collectively and formed God. And that was extraordinarily profound because it changes everything. It changes the way that we have been viewing ourselves since the moment we could we took our first breath that we were somehow insignificant and that we didn't have a direct connection to god and that we didn't really our purpose and our existence here didn't have much real meaning outside of maybe our own process of living none of that is true it's just the opposite as God, we each and every individual has a supreme purpose for being here. And if we could see that and experience that and feel that, we literally not only would start creating miracles, we would change the world overnight. And that's not an expression. It's real. So when I came back, I remember one of the things that I can do now very easily is I speak to a voice that in the book, um, I discuss how that whole evolution started. But I will just tell you that that voice is what's known as the collective. And that voice allowed me in time, and I developed a really close friendship with this voice. And um, it, um, it gave me permission to give it a name so that I could kind of humanize it a little bit for people and for myself. And so the voice, uh, I call it Caleb. And if anybody's even somewhat familiar with the spiritual circles, it's no different than say the voice that people have heard about through Abraham Hicks or other, other people who can channel. But we have this voice, all of us have the same voice. Um, and And that voice has guided me throughout my life and and that voice um shared with me a couple of things that was going to be helpful to explain to people how is it possible that we that we uh, individually are gods and came together to form this thing called what we call today god or source or spirit or whatever you want to call it it doesn't really matter there's no labels where we come from okay um so there's this really cool expression that you hear sometimes. It's it, but the meaning of it is a little bit construed different. It's construed differently. Um, so there's this analogy of the ocean, and and you always hear about it. One day we're gonna, one day when we die, we'll go back and become. We're just droplets in the ocean. We'll come back to it. All right, and and that's a really nice, beautiful analogy, but it gives the impression that we go back into the light because we're separated from the light and that, and that the light is this big ocean and that's the most important piece of it. And so they told me, they said, imagine, imagine the ocean filled with unlimited number of droplets. And they said, the ocean cannot exist without the droplets, but the droplets can exist without the ocean meaning that we are together as the ocean but we can exist without it we are gods we are god it's nothing that we should be afraid of or get angry over or whatever it's a, the most beautiful gift of awareness we could have mm. is to realize that we've never been anything less than god and what we can do with that is extraordinary. And that's the time that we're living in now is to realize who we are so that we could create heaven on earth overnight. So that's my story. <laughs> Beautiful. So many questions. I don't know where to begin. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling you were going to be filled with questions. All right, let's start with Caleb. Uh, yes. How 
how did the first message encounter in your head, the voice? What was it it happened when I was um, about, it, the earliest, earliest, earliest was when I was about one, when I could remember Caleb sort of being near me or by me, kind of explaining to me my surroundings. Um, at one, you don't have, you don't expect to have any real memories of anything, but I had very vivid memories of my home at one. I could explain very vividly the details of our home and all the experiences to me were very dynamic. You, we don't realize just how much our sen our empathic abilities are turned on at that, at that age ages one through seven or eight but what we don't realize is how much our empathic abilities were turned on even before we took our first breath um the moment that we were conceived and and we started experiencing our environment that's a whole different experience than what most people understand um we didn't if i may i'll just briefly say that in the time that we're in our in our parents in our mother's womb, mm -hmm. it's the body that gets a lot of information stored in it from its environment. Um, but it's not the soul. The soul doesn't actually this might 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 or might not offend some people, but the soul does not actually integrate with the body until the very last moment before you're actually physically born. Um, it's the body that's going through a tremendous amount of simulation uh, with a lot of information, what I would call coding, okay? Mm -hmm. um, because the body is an, an avatar. It's, it's in the most extraordinary intelligence yeah. of, that we would call today artificial intelligence. Um, for that's for another discussion. So, um, so at a very early age, I, I was aware of my environment and I was aware of the voice that was kind of helping me to understand my world. Um, it was up until about age five that when we, because that was when we moved into what I call the hauntings. Um, that was where I actually experienced the voice very intimately because at night um, when things were very interesting in our home um, and they were interesting throughout the day too, but this at night there was more of it. And um, I just remember that I would go into, I would crawl into bed and I would put the blankets over me because I was really scared. Um, and I remember that I could feel them literally. And I say them because again, it's a collective Um I could feel them sort of laying or sitting next to me and they would whisper in my ear. They would always whisper in my ear things, but it was usually, you know, don't worry. They would say, don't worry. Your light shines too brightly. They, they won't hurt you. Um, and I just always had that sort of feeling that I had sort of this intimate relationship with something that others would probably have called an imaginary friend. Um, and there's a lot to imaginary friends that mm -hmm. I also I also <laughs> teach about in in the course that the coursework that I do. It's an extraordinarily powerful connection to the higher aspects of you as God. But we close that down when we're little because people tell us to do that or not to even have one. Um, but anyway, it would have been described like an imaginary friend. So I, I talk about that in the book as well. The first half of the book that I wrote is about my whole life in terms of how I got to this point, which wasn't easy. And, and it was, and it was, it was intentional to write it that way so that I could show people that I didn't just pop in here and had, you know, these mystical abilities to, to tap into people's souls and 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 teach them things that they didn't know they knew had uh, it, this was a process and it was a process that that I made more difficult <laughs> because I didn't want to accept the possibility that I could be something so much greater than I ever thought I could be and so I wrote it like that to show people their story too that they are much greater than who they are. And so at the age of five, I really began to experience that relationship with, with the collective. It didn't have a name. 
until I was about 40. And that's when I, that's 40, maybe even 45, somewhere around there, um, that I re realized that I, I felt like I needed to give it a name, but I didn't want to ask. And they said, you can give us a name and we give you permission. And, but I asked them who, what do you want to call? What do I, what should I call you? And that's when they said Kayla. So. Wow. Amazing. And what is the message now from uh, <laughs> for the human beings? <laughs> um, that this life, this the this time it, it is as unique as so there's so many people out there. There's so many people, so, so many people that know there's something different about themselves and know that there's something different about the world around them. And and even and I have to be really mindful and careful about the way I say that last part, because it's not as much about the world around them. Initially, it is because they look at themselves and they compare themselves to what's out there. And they realize that they just don't fit in. They just never have fit in and more so even now. And some of them may have thought that they have fit in, but now they don't. And they view themselves as somehow being not normal you know like like there's something wrong with them and and that somehow the world has figured it out and somehow you haven't but it's actually the other way around the world hasn't figured it out it's you that is figuring it out and so the biggest message and it's again there there's multiple messages but the biggest message is that everything that we have been told everything that we have dreamt about prayed if you will for a time when we could finally look you know the things like i always tell people like we have spent thousands of years looking up at the sky waiting for something to happen in our hearts in our souls waiting thirsting for it hungering for it waiting for its chariots or some lights or something brilliant to come out and say okay it's over <laughs> you know <laughs> that that time is now and it isn't that it's going to be lights in the sky although there is a little of that coming with what is going to happen in the next few years with with ufos and stuff um but more importantly those things are going to happen because the thing that we've been waiting for our entire life for centuries has been us it's been it's been us. We've been waiting for us to realize who we are. We're the last piece. We're the piece of the puzzle that's been missing. Once we realize it's always been us, that we've been waiting for us to realize who we are, then everything will change exactly the way that we've always dreamt it would. And that moment isn't 100 years from now. It's now. It's so everyone, right. So it's us coming home? Coming home to ourselves to realize that this, that we are God, that this has all just been a beautiful, I know this is going to sound weird, but a beautiful dream, a game, a simulation, a true simulation, that this was all an experience that we were supposed to have, but a real, real game. Okay. Like, I'm not kidding, not like a metaphor, but a real game. And that as crazy as this is going to sound, as if I haven't already said a lot of crazy stuff, right? That this game is 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 hardwired. It's connected to you, to you. So, you know, Gandhi used to say, or one of his most amazing phrases was, you have to be the change you want to see in the world. And as a very little kid, I, I've always felt like that message had a deeper meaning to it. And the deepest meaning that you can give it is, is that this reality, this reality that is a simulation is connected to you, just you. Now, there's a lot into that too, okay? But just just accept that truth and you could see why you could change the world. And that's the awakening, the the the, the awareness of coming home is the awareness of the fact that you never left home as a spiritual being. Mm, opening your heart. Be Big love. Time. Yes. Don't say and, 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 
And and here's the thing. When we say that, it can sometimes get lost in, in the cliche of, of, of it. But what I said early on about love and how you can't describe it here, when you realize who you are, truly allow yourself to accept who you are. So I teach this thing called the way of the inner child. And it is the most extraordinary, simple and playful process of, of awareness and awakening that you could possibly have. It's so ridiculously simple. You sit there and you go, how is this possible that through this, you're going to not only remember who you are, but that you're going to know yourself and become God and experience the most incredible, magical experiences of your life. The things that you never thought you could do, synchronicities and, and are just simple things. But I'm talking about magical, mystical things, magical things where you can actually start to see your life changing and the way that you're impacting yourself and other people's lives full of love and joy. Because the one thing that we tend to forget is that we're not just here to, to imbue love. We're here to imbue joy. In this particular game that we're playing, this one, joy is the end result. It is what we strive for. And it, it doesn't mean that love isn't huge because love is enormously huge. It doesn't, like I said before, it doesn't exist where we come from, all of us. It doesn't exist the way it exists here. But joy, why do we fall in love? Why do we fall in love? Because we want to be happy. Why do we do anything in this life? Because we want to be happy. Joy is the end result of what we're trying to achieve here. And so when we come to realize these pieces, oh, the energy in this world will go off the charts. And when the energy goes off the charts, quantum physics will tell you everything will change. Everything. And you say, well, how can it happen so fast? Trust me, there's a lot of explanation I can give you right now, but it would take up more time. And I will tell you, it will happen literally overnight. Very interesting, very profound. Yeah, I can tell you're feeling it. Mm. <clears throat> so let's talk about joy. Let's yes. ask Caleb, how would they describe joy? Oh, that's easy. That's easy. Imagine yourself, and this is this is where imagination comes in. OK, remember, I said that at a young age, we lose our ability to connect to what this thing we would have called our imaginary friends. So imagine yourself. Being four or five years old again, and you say, well, you know, I had a really traumatizing life in the, when I was a child. And I say, OK, but just leave that those events aside and just allow yourself to be for just this playful time just be four or five years old again and experience the world through the eyes of that type of being. Now, when I say four or five, I don't just mean four or five human years. I mean, it doesn't take much for you to close your eyes and just allow yourself to be the essence of a child. Okay. Close your eyes. Imagine yourself feeling wonderment, feeling naivety, in a beautiful way, right? Feeling joy, feeling happiness and that sense of just playfulness, just feeling peacefulness and warmth mm -hmm. and kindness. You can do this. It's not that difficult. You just close your eyes and just, if you only, people will say, I can't feel these emotions sometimes. I said, no, 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 wait, wait. Just imagine, imagine a world where you're in it and you can feel that. You have full permission to feel that. You can bring all the luggage back. You can walk out the door and you can feel all of the heaviness you want to feel when you leave this place. But just let your imagination go. And it's so easy for people to do it. It's so easy for them to experience innocence. Innocence. Oh, my God. That is such a beautiful feeling. When we have what we call a kundalini experience, and not everybody knows what that is, but it's just this magnificent feeling of being lit up from the inside out. 
one of the things that you feel, if not the greatest thing that you feel in that experience, is the overwhelming sense of innocence that you all of a sudden get consumed by. It is so powerful that you literally, and I can say this because I've had this experience multiple times now, you literally get on your knees. You just drop to your knees. You don't get on your knees. You drop to your knees and you are so overwhelmed with joy and love and bliss and peace and everything because it's all wrapped up in this innocence of a child that you literally start to cry. You literally bawl. You just literally, because it is that beautiful and that powerful. I always tell people that in the in the face of innocence, fear will just bow to it. It will just bow to it. It's not that difficult to feel that. If it's nothing else in the world of your imagination. So I teach a lot about imagination because it is the key. It is the key back to your higher self, to your soul. Mm. Yeah. Innocence. That's the word. Yeah. And we feel many times, and there's a whole process of how I walk people through this. It's very gentle. It's very sweet. Um, but there's a sense sometimes that we've been robbed of that. But it's never left. It never left. And it's so easy to tap back into. And when you do, at first, it feels somewhat hurtful, painful, like as if you have to release a lot of a lot of hurt, um, but it immediately gets overwhelmed by this enormous, infinite sense of just having that. It just, it just, it's part of you. It's not something that was ever robbed from you. So one of the most common misconceptions that we have out there is that the child that we have experienced from a spiritual standpoint is, is hurt or wounded the child has never been hurt or wounded. It has always known who it is. And it's the child that tends to be the one that will help us, the adult version of the child, go beyond the hurt. Ah, <laughs> We're all children walking around, right? <laughs> yes. And we should embrace that and mm -hmm. play in it, really, and have and see the joy in it. But we're told that's not that's not allowed, and that is allowed. I'm telling you that what is coming, that's here all around us, that we just have to tap into. That we have to become aware of who we are. That energy is all about that. It's all about tapping back into it to feel that sense of 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 innocent youth again, blissful, happy, joyful youth again. It's not far away. And our souls, who we really are, which is just a version of our consciousness, it thirsts for that again because it knows itself to be that. But we have told ourselves we're not anymore. We want freedom. Freedom. And that, too, is how we express to your question, how do we experience that? We will. It's not that hard to tap into. We feel that those things have been taken away from us. They have not. This is all a dream, a game. And we wake up to that and we realize how easy it is to access that again. We've made even spirituality very, very, very difficult. We've made it very complicated. All these things we have to do to find some, some answers to our forbidden questions. And I'm telling you that the messages that I came back with are to tell humanity that it doesn't have to be that difficult. We've made it too complicated. It is simple. It's very simple, very much similar to the Christ energies and all these things that we talk about. If you, if you ever read about what they were, it was all about simplicity. In fact, if we wanted to get even a little bit religious, there are references in various sacred books whether it's buddhism hinduism um Christ, judeo christianity any of them the only way 
into what we would call the kingdom of heaven. The only, only way. There's no exception into the kingdom of heaven. And kingdom of heaven is this thing we would refer to the way that I have been teaching it is just a, a heightened state of consciousness, okay? The only way to do that is by being a child. No exception. So, love it. Love, 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 teach. love it. <laughs> I'm glad. More play, <laughs> more fun. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Love, yeah. yeah. A love oh, of your it, it's it's the love and play and joy of first mm -hmm. and foremost of falling in love with yourself. So here's the interesting thing, which I actually understand why it's happening. Because if you understood, if you really, really understand that this is a game, you'd understand how the game is played. So it doesn't surprise me that this day and age, especially in the last five years, and there's a lot of reason to to validate this. So I'm not going to say, I'm, I'm not arguing about that at all. I'm not arguing about anything actually. Okay. But there, I'm just observing that in the last four or five years, there's been a heightened sense of understanding what this term narcissism is. Okay. Now, the only thing I will say about that is this, we are getting to a point in our spiritual evolution where we are being asked to fall in love with ourselves, to remember how it is to have the most intimate, beautiful romance you could have with you, with just you. Mm -hmm. And because we live in a world of contrast, specifically designed to make mm -hmm. sure that you don't experience that, because if you did, the game would be over. Yes. It starts to heighten mm -hmm. things that would prevent you from exploring that. So I've been surprised at how in the last four or five years, but not surprised, it's more rhetorical, that there's this sense of everything having to do with narcissism, which in and of itself is, in, if it's not used, if, if that energy is not used properly, it does, it can, and it does cause hurt. But it prevents people, just the generalness of that discussion, it prevents people from wanting to go inside desiring to go inside and have this incredible, beautiful, blissful um, romance with yourself. Yeah, because you're taking your power back as well. When you've been experiencing, you know, contrast, you yes. learn the darkness and then it's all about you coming back home, taking your power back and stepping into. Yes. 100% self-acceptance. And, and, it, and it's, it, and I will say that we in the things that I that I also teach is the the mindfulness of how to use words, because words are tremendously powerful and not in the way that we've talked about. I mean, we we hear people talk about be mindful of your words. Words have consequences. Words, you know, have actionable this and that. Yes, but from a spirit realm, it it, it teaches. It's about the mindfulness. It's about consciousness because words are just ways in which we use symbols to express. A divine thought okay and so we're not really claiming we're not reclaiming anything we already had it it's just remembering we we never had our power taken away from us which we, we couldn't because if we did we couldn't have created this world we couldn't we meaning you could not have created the reality that you have existed in and this has a lot of very technical science behind it too if we ever wanted to go in that mm -hmm. direction but i'm just simply saying that you could not have created the world around you and the people around you and the events around you if you were not god it would be impossible it's never about reclaiming or taking back it was about remembering mm-hmm mm-hmm Spot on. I think we're here to learn things, experience contrast, grow. Yes. However, I do need to interject something. I apologize for doing that, but it's important that people understand. And I talk about this in the book that there was a time for that. There was a time when we came here to do exactly what you're talking about. But the time has changed and it has been this way for some time now, probably in the last hundred years or so. 
it's really heightened now. I mean, like it is like really like at the apex. We're not here to do those things anymore. We've done them. We've done them a million billion times over. We have done it every which way. We can't come up with any more ways of learning things. If you're a God, you don't learn anything. You grow. If you're a God now, now, the only thing that's left is to remember. We are experiencing how to remember. We're learning how to remember. We're being taught to remind ourselves how to remember. Everything is about remembering that we were never, ever unaware of anything. You're God. You know everything. And trust me, if you talk to many near-death experiencers, the moment that they detach themselves from their bodies, they will tell you they remember everything, like everything, like how the universe was created, everything. You never, ever, ever had to learn anything. You just had to remember. Lovely. Thank you so much for sharing this very profound information. It's just super easy to understand the way you brings the messages across. It's just very, very simple for anyone, I think, to get the whole picture, yeah. right? I hope so anyway. Yep. For me, it's well, very easy to Yeah, to I mean, you hear. get it. it, it the, the first step is to get it. The first step is to get in. And this is why I say that, you know, when people when people um, look to their guides, you know, and they're, whether they're, they're angels or this or that, they're looking for this type of simple wisdom. And that's all it is. It's just really simple wisdom. Hmm. But knowing it, understand, knowing it from an intellectual level, that's that part of it. Today, now, most people can at least put their arms around. They may not agree with it, but they'll put their arms around it and go, okay, I could at least. No, knowing that part of it intellectually is easy. It's it's actually having the faith in yourself, in yourself, to embrace it and embody it so that you could actually confidently, absolutely, without any question, know yourself to be who you are. That's the part that takes a little bit more of a process, but that's so simple too, because you just have to let go and surrender yourself back to being a child. Children can do, have, be anything they desire. And we are children. In fact, the way I talk about it in many of the interviews that I do and refer to it in the book, because it was shown to me this way by Caleb, this thing we call God, the collectiveness of who we are, we're children. In the spiritual world, we are literally children. Um, we have the temperament of children. That doesn't mean that we are naive like how we interpret children to be here. We are an extraordinarily powerful essence of a child. That's who we are. And so in the world of contrast, it makes complete sense to create a being that we call God as this white old man with a beard because we are not. We are just the opposite. We are children. And we love to play. Mm, love that. So empowering. It <laughs> is. <laughs> it really is. It's meant to be. It's yeah. meant to be. Yeah. All right. Uh, my standard question is, as yeah. I ask everyone, what's your biggest fear you have had or have <laughs> in your life say that again i'm sorry what's the biggest fear you have in your life you know this is my standard question i ask everyone yeah. um that's a you toughie got any... mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because i because i don't have fear anymore and i mean that sincerely i, mm -hmm. I don't the way that so okay i'll, I'll try to keep this I, I i know i get a little lengthy here but when we realize why we're here, we realize that fear isn't something to be feared. Fear is something that we are meant to to actually develop a beautiful friendship with. And because because if you take away the if you strip away the word fear and just give it the energy, 
it's very magical. You can create. It's because of contrast of fear that we create worlds in our spiritual worlds. Um, we can imagine and desire. If we knew what fear really was, we wouldn't fear it. We we would really become friends with it and and really play with it like a child would play with it. Again, children don't really fear. They don't know what fear is. They would play with it and sit with it, and they do. So I don't I don't have that fear of fear anymore. <laughs> um, but it's taken a long time. I mean, I used to fear a lot of stuff. I would have given you a list of you know two pages long of everything that I feared, but I don't fear anymore. I honestly, all I really feel is love and joy. Mm. You're in heaven on earth already. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Where do you hope we are in 10 years from now in the world? <laughs> do you understand the kind of questions you're asking me? <laughs> I do. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh my gosh. All right. One of the things that I can do is I can, I receive prophecies. Okay. So 10 years from now, we put us in the year 2033. Okay. In what I have seen of the world, of our world in the year 2033, we will have stepped into what is called the sixth dimension in 2033, which is where we no longer rely or need to exist in our bodies anymore. We will have a consciousness awareness that we no longer are our bodies. I mean, that will have happened years before, years before. But in 2033, we step into that, which means that we become light beings the kind of light beings that we would normally become if we died physically. But we are not here to die physically anymore. We don't have to experience physical death to experience ourselves as light beings. So in 10 years, <laughs> we will all be in the sixth dimension, which means that we will have heaven on earth, which means that the world that we exist today will no longer exist. It will be extraordinarily different. It will be a world where we won't have to connect through channeling to the higher selves of who we are. We won't have to connect through a clairvoyant or a psychic to talk to those who have passed. We will be with them in this world. When we say heaven on earth, we're, that's not an expression. I'm, we're literally saying heaven on earth. So for me, I suspect that I will be pretty close to being done with my job here. Because I came here to facilitate that. And I know that when humanity has finally achieved that level of consciousness, my job will be done. Amazing. So inspirational. Very, very uplifting for mankind to hear. And um, it's pretty incredible what's what is about to happen to humanity. Yeah, it's so exciting to be alive right now. It's it is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you that the next 18 months of humanity mm -hmm. is going to be extraordinary. It will be a time where humanity will go deeper within itself than it has ever gone. And it will, in doing so, that's what I call the quest. In doing so, it will put itself in a position to receive spiritual energies unlike anything it has ever experienced. And these would be the high fourth and fifth dimensional energies to be, just to explain real briefly what that means. It means that, that when you get to fifth dimensional energy is when you really come to fully understand yourself as God. I mean, fully, fully. That doesn't mean you don't get some of that beforehand. But in the next 18 months, we will all be going through, humanity will be going through this massive, 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 what I would call downloading and preparing you for the most significant activation 
than it has ever seen. So that by the year 2025, that year is called the year of the, it, you won't find this anywhere, but this is being told to me that it is the year of the reveal, which is to say that humanity will step into a big stream of fifth dimensional awareness. Um, and that's where you will see things happen such as enormous miracles that will be 2025, right? 2025. And, and, um, and you will see also awareness and connection with the other levels of the spirit world, which we often refer to as the galactics or the UFOs, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's going to be a massive reveal, but it's an inward reveal. First, you will start to realize that you can no longer connect with this world that there Yeshua once said that he was in this world and not of it. And that's what we will start to experience as a collective body. We will no longer connect with this world, not the pieces of it that have been so heavy and so dense that we have been suffocated by it. So 2025 is a massive year, a massive, but leading up to it is going to be pretty interesting too. It's not like it's going to happen in 2025. No, it's happening right now, all the way into 2025. When you said you were resting, that is the this is the period of rest for humanity. It's not going to be like sleeping rest where you're going to go, oh, comfortable. And that's not necessarily, it's going to be full of a lot of energy it's going to be flowing in, new energy that you've never had before. Ways that your body are going to activate itself, the physical body and the light body. That's all going to be in preparation for what's going to happen in 2025. It is going to be very, very, very powerful. Come on, wait. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't wait. Start doing it now. Start tapping yeah. into it now. It's there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So manifest whatever you wish. Make your dreams come true. And and become... have have the faith in yourself to be able to make mm -hmm. it happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's the big piece you have to have the faith in yourself if you don't have the faith in yourself and you're asking for something out there to do it for you there's a part of that but not much um it's all about the faith in yourself believing you yourself right yeah. yeah so i also teach this thing in the courses in the course that i teach in the way of the inner child the faith has nine steps to it and believing is only the third step in the nine wow. steps Mm -hmm. um to really 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 have faith is to absolutely 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 know that you are able to create and that takes a little bit of faith in it of itself but it takes a lot of innocence and imagination as a child hmm. maybe we can talk about that in another episode how to <laughs> yeah yeah we could do. yeah yeah See, you're manifesting right now. We are manifesting this life because this is the level at which your faith has taken you. You don't even know that you are doing this. You don't even know that you're creating the room you're in, the life you're experiencing. It's you that is accountable to you now. And that's not always that easy because your whole life has been about being beaten down into believing that you don't have that kind of power. But it's written everywhere in every sacred book. It's written how powerful we are. Mm. Something we should all remember to work on our faith, you know, oh, do the job. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Well, let's talk about that in the next one. I would love sure. to do that. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you so much for today. It's been so much amazing, profound information, very uplifting, very positive, and very, very inspirational. Thank you for having me. Lovely. That everything I said, I want to be really sincere about this. Everything I said was for you. Oh, really? Yep. It was for you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Now I'm very touched. I'm almost started crying. <laughs> hmm. I came here just to do this for you. Oh, that's so okay. nice. I almost had that feeling. Yep. Because you felt my soul. Yep. And you want to help me. 
just wanted you to remember.